On my way to the moon I don't think I'll be positive I'll make my own moves Oh, what a beautiful view So today, guys, we have a very special guest with us. We have Brother Wayne Chandler. His link is at the top. Um, Brother Wayne is someone that I have been knowing. He's actually a personal friend. And he's somebody that I have been knowing for a very long time, about mm, seven, eight years, you know, give or take. Um, someone that I have, I consider a mentor that I have went to with um, a lot of my own questions, right? So, you know, like I tell you guys, you know, even though you may see me in teaching mode, I'm always a student. So let's talk, let me give you a little bit of background information about um, Brother Wayne. So Brother ba Wayne Beach Handler, um, he's an author of the best-selling book, Ancient Future, the Teachings and Prophetic Wisdom of the Seven Hermetic Laws and of Ancient Egypt, and an upcoming series, um, The Brighter Side of Darkness, A Light Warrior's Guide to Inner Alchemy and Spiritual Transformation. He is both a student and instructor of Qigong under Grandmaster Montauk Chia and senior instructor and master teacher Mink DeVos, author of um, Tao, The Tao Tantric Arts for Women. He has um, had several sa satellite instructors who have um, added greatly to his understanding and discipline of Qigong, such as Grandmaster Yang Wing Ming, Tao uh, Wang, senior instructor and master teacher Sharon Smith, Wan Li, and master Marilog. Wayne is also a practitioner in a special and advanced form of medical Qigong and has been under the tutelage of Grandmaster Cho Kok Su, master teacher Sybil Baker, and master Stephen Ko. He um, holds cert certifications from that discipline in holographic repatterning, intuitive therapy, and pranic healing. And guys, I've actually um, participated um, in one of those sessions, um, which is like distance healing. And that helped me greatly. He helped me during a time when I was going through some things where I had to sort of like rebuild my aura. Um, and it really, really helped me a lot. Um, so Wayne has uh, was one of the major national and international instructors asked to teach in March 2022 at the Global Qigong Sum Summit. He designed and, and implemented the program, The Alchemy of Qigong Empowerment, which um, he has taught online since 2009 and spearheaded seven day retreats with the same theme in Jamaica, Costa Rica, Puerto Rico, Egypt, the UK, Uganda, and Spain. And guys, he has one coming up this year. I believe it's in August. We'll let him tell us about it in Mexico. So um, his extracurricular activities include over 30 years of training and teaching in both the martial arts and yoga. He founded the Wealth Building Community Initiative, creating strategies for generating wealth while you sleep. As a music performer, he has worked with legendary jazz pianist Randy Weston for 20 years on various projects, the latest being a CD titled The Nubian, the Nubian Suite, released in 2018. So with that being said, Welcome, Wayne. How's it going? How are you doing today? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm doing a lot better after getting through those uh, phone hiccups. <laughs> it's a little stressful, right? <laughs> Trying to figure out this, some of this technology that's going on, but I really appreciate you being here. Yeah, it's. It, I'm. I'm excited. I'm excited. It's. Uh, it's an area um, of conversation that I rarely get a chance to delve into um, just because of, of its content. So, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about it. OK, perfect. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, you know, we've been having conversations for years and you kind of know, like, as you know, someone that looks up to you, like how my mind works and you've seen my progress and, you know, like, I'm always trying to figure things out. And so that's what I've been doing, but actually sharing that with an audience now, right? And I've been trying to build this quote unquote timeline of humanity, right? So you wrote a book um, called Ancient Future where you get into the um, seven alchemical principles, which we speak about a lot, you know, in um, the spaces that I hold and create um, via the Kabbalion of the three initiates. So we, we speak on that quite often. Um, however, can you just start us off with, you know, your perspective on how human, how um, our human, you know, race began here on Earth from like the time of Atlantis, Lemuria, and even if you know of um, before we actually fell into human 
form and when did the man's you know the scent of man begin i know that's a lot so just you know pick up wherever you'd like <laughs> <laughs> um yeah that's a lot you know one of the things one of the uh texts that I, I i came up with in terms of my studies into uh, metaphysics uh back in the day um was through a uh, an author by the name of uh, Helena Petrova Bolivatsky. And in reading uh, one of her more acclaimed pieces, uh, The Secret Doctrine, she breaks down um, two, there's, there's two books in this one book. One is called Cosmogenesis, and the other one is Anthropogenesis. And in Anthropogenesis, she breaks down the beginnings um, of the uh, formation, the design of what would come to be a human being and its completion. Now, what she did, just giving a little bit of background about her, she um, was writing in the 1800s. Uh, the Secret Doctrine was written, I believe it was 1888, when that book was um, released. And it was a basically a transmission of information that was given to her in part by one of her teachers, one of her master teachers that she had you know, um, studied with in Tibet. So when she first went to Tibet, she had written a book called Isis Unveiled. And in that book, Isis Unveiled, she basically quoted many of the, um, you know, academics, academicians at that time who were, you know, of course, you know, uh, European and were very um, racist in terms of how they perceived history. So what she did is she began to travel to various places, trying to uncover other aspects of the historical record and went into Tibet and was asking um, the monks there if she could have access to some of the uh, Canaans that were there that had been hidden there for millennia and they wouldn't let her in and they told her that where she was in her own development spiritually and what she had written with respect to the book before um, the secret doctrine Isis unveiled was really misinformation and they told her at that time that she would have to go on a sojourn and really uncover some of the true authentic uh information that these ancient civilizations held so she was able to do that and came back about uh eight years later and they gave her entrance and they allowed her to study and in that process they pretty much revealed to her a uh, a canon a book that was called um the book of dijon and the book of dijon was this incredible piece that had been handed down you know from one century to the next, one millennia to the next. And she was actually able, you know, to study and see the formation of, in terms of what was being written and how it was being formed and expressed, the development of the universe and its various principles, as well as humanity and its various principles. So with that, she was able 
to break down, you know, because when you read the secret doctrine, the secret doctrine is, is a profoundly intense piece of work. And most people who pick it up, they open it, they read a paragraph and they put it back down because that's how deep, you know, the book is. But she does get into an anthropogenesis, the formation of what would come to be humanity. And she explains that in the very beginning, we have various bodies within our own physical body. We have the astral form, the etheric, you know, we have several different bodies that are housed within the one. And when you look at the formation, you know, of what would later become a human being in its totality, it really begins with these astral forms and etheric bodies, which they called shadow bodies. And the longer the shadow body remained in contact with three dimensional reality, it integrated with the energies of the earth and over, you know, literally millions of years, you know, we began to form or have a more solid uh, form of matter, which began to literally cover the shadow bodies, these etheric forms that one could really take their hand and move right through it and go from one end to the other side. So as these forms began to integrate more with the earth and what the earth was producing, was bringing, the earth began to literally create um, a covering, you know, for these specific forms, these shadow bodies. And that was the very beginning of the ascent into being uh, a totality, <laughs> A, a, a totality in terms of humanity or human form. And that led all the way up to what we identify right now as the fifth root race. But when you look at the shadow beings, these entities that really began to move through from one millennia to the next, they really create a uh, stream of consciousness that deals with the, how you can say, the incarnated entities that came from different dimensional fields and different planes of existence and would incarnate into these different shadow bodies and literally create different levels of consciousness that they would be able to move, form, and deliver higher realms and expressions of that consciousness from one root race into the other. And so in the book of Dijon, it gets into the nature and the process and procedure of the various root races, starting with this shadow race, which then, you know, has a covering created for it, which creates more or less a race that becomes, they refer to them as the egg born. And so they were literally reproducing in the way that, you know, we, we conceive, uh, reptiles, you know, producing, you know, that they lay eggs and these eggs would then transform and generate a form of life, but that form of life was humanoid. And 
from the second root race, you then moved into, you know, the second root race, the egg born or the sweat born, as they refer to them, you then move into the third root race. In the third root race, this is when it gets really interesting because in the third root race, we identify the third root race today as Mu or the Lemurians. And the Lemurians constitute the third root race, which gave birth to the fourth root race. And that's when things really began to get very exciting because that was the Atlantean race or the race that we identify as the Atlantean race. And when you get into the significance of what they created and how they were really the forerunners of all of the things that we now utilize and take for granted, you know, in terms of uh, aeronautics, um, in, in terms of the utilization of, of light energy for healing, uh, laser technology, um, you know, aeronautics in the, in the sense of they actually had planes which moved through the skies. They called them Vivans. And these Vivans were literally uh, like crystal driven ships that through vibrational frequency would elevate from the ground and then have a pattern of direction that would allow the inhabitant of the ship to move through the air. And we actually, when I was working with uh, Dr. Van Sertiman, we did research and created this one book called Egypt Revisited. We actually found um, old documents which identify some of these ships that were in the ancient dynastic period of Kemet or Egypt. And it's really one of the things that I found to be fascinating was Edgar Cayce actually in one of his books got very profoundly and intricately <laughs> connected to Atlantean culture and civilization. And he talks about these Virwans. And he says that he refers to this group or community of organizers called the 64th Congress. And these individuals had to come together to deliberate on a critical uh, condition that they were being challenged with. And this condition that they were being challenged with <laughs> was that when these Vyawans were moving through the air, they were being attacked by pterodactyls. And these pterodactyls would lay waste to many of these flying ships. Now being connected and integrated with the natural world at this time, they didn't want to just exterminate these flying reptiles because they had the technology to easily eradicate them. But they didn't want to do that, so they actually came together to determine how they were going to deal with this problem of them being in the skies and these winged reptilian creatures also being in the skies. So when you get into the uh, dynamics of Atlantean culture and civilization, you're looking at the first complete um, human species. So you're looking at all of the things that we carry and more.
you know, because when you look at a lot of what um, is in the book of Dijon, there are things that are stated which gives insight to exactly how we ended up in this karmic dance that we're in right now. You know, so one of the um, stanzas is very fascinating and it talks about Atlantis. It says, then the fourth became tall with pride. We are the kings, it was said. We are the gods. They took wives fair to look upon, wives from the mindless, the narrow headed. They bred monsters, wicked demons, male and female. Also, Kado Dakini with little minds. They built temples for the human body, male and female, they worshiped. Then the third eye acted no longer. They built huge cities of rare earths and metals they built. And out of the fires vomited, out of the white stone of the mountains and out of the black stone, they cut their own images in their size and likeness and worshiped them. They built great images, nine yatis high, the size of their bodies. Inner fires had destroyed the land of their fathers. The water threatened the fourth. The first great waters came. They swallowed the seven great islands. All holy save, the unholy destroyed. With them, most of the huge animals produced from the sweat of the earth. Few men remained, some yellow, some brown and black, and some red remained. The moon colored were gone forever. The fifth produced from the holy stock remained. It was ruled over by the first divine kings who redescended, who made peace with the fifth, who taught and instructed it. So when you read passages like that coming out of an ancient Canaan, it opens the mind to a variety of different prospects and just really shifting our perception of why we're here, what we're here to do, and what are the consequences of being here at this time and what it is that we came here to remember. And that's probably the greatest challenge that we have at this time is remembering who we are, what we are, and why we're here. You know, when you look at the word Adam, Adam comes from the word Adimi, and Adimi literally translates into the dark race. So the Adamic race was the race that we now refer to as the Atlantean species. And it was this race that in its totality, you know, dealing with all the different aspects of transcendent behavior and perception that they carry, they also dealt with tone, you know, hearing. Um, their bodies were massively formed. I mean, in terms of size, they were probably averaging anywhere between nine to 10 feet in height, easy. And when you look at the passages that tell the story of their civilization, there's so much that we've been given with respect to the information about Ham. 
and Ham being the father, you know, of the black race, but at the same time being cursed. Now, a lot of historians really have issues with that translation. But the thing is, when you go back into the antediluvian canons, things begin to make sense because the civilization of Atlantis lasted for four million years. For four million years. Lemuria lasted for 10 million years. So what happened in the latter stages of the Atlantean empire came with and at the expense of a degenerative condition that basically had flowed over large areas of the continent. But the thing with the continent, the Atlantean continent, is that it was broken down into two continental regions. One was called Ruta, the other one was called Daicha. And Daicha was the area where a lot of what we now are living through was first initiated and created in terms of genetic engineering, in terms of high level uh, technologies that had profound impact on consciousness, both good and bad. So what we're seeing now, because they actually applied and utilize those technologies on a species that they genetically engineered. And so when you look at what's taking place right now on the planet, <laughs> the karma is just profound to me because I understand the story in its entirety. I get the story. And so most of us, that are here now, you know, we talk about our ancestors, but we can never forget the wheel of incarnation because we are our ancestors. And we are here now. Most of us have come from that Atlantean portal and we're here to work out these last karmic underpinnings that we've been carrying, you know, for millennia. Wow. Wow. Oof. Oof. Okay. I'm going okay, to mute. Gonna mute. I got to mute your mic real quick. Cause I'm getting some feedback. Um, wow. That was amazing guys. And that's what scholarship sounds like, right? With actual real data. Um, my mind is like, um, not that I haven't heard this before, but just the way that you broke it down, um, and unpacked it right from the beginning. Um, it's just astounding, you know? And so what I want to ask you, right, you know, we're going to bring it forth because it's the ancient and the future, which it all brings it together. Okay. Um, so it sounds like to me, if you said the Lemurian was like, um, their culture was 9 million years and then 4 million years for the Atlanteans, um, at what point, so it sounds like we were already beginning, um, in a fallen state One is the third dimension. What are your thoughts on the Sumerian tablets and the Anunnaki, you know, coming from the planet um, Nibiru and coming to interact with the earth beings? What are your thoughts on that? The Sumerian didn't have long division. Who was that? Jim and Mountain View. Go ahead, Wayne. Oh, okay. So on, to unmute your mic, all you have to do is like look at your screen at the bottom right. There's a little microphone. So you just like um, click that microphone and it will unmute your microphone and you'll be able to talk. Sorry about that. I had to mute you because um, when I was speaking, there was like an echo. Yeah, 
Wayne, um, just look at the bottom, uh, look at your screen. And at the bottom right of your screen, there's a, like a, the bottom right, <clears throat> there's a little microphone. And so if you click that microphone, you'll be able to unmute your, you know, you'll be able to speak. Perfect. Got it. All right. <laughs> We're live. Okay. So I was asking, did you hear my question about like, I did, um, I okay. did. And, okay. and you know, there's, um, there's a lot of validity, you know, in that, that, um, is, is really pretty profound and it, it goes into, um, during the period that became the area of destruction because of what was implemented by the Atlantean uh, were this one aspect of the Atlantean race that um, <laughs> they really um, got to a place because see they were very different like a lot of the things that we're doing right now with respect to nanotechnology genetic engineering and you know all of the things that we are now being challenged with from the shots that are being administered to the uh upcoming form uh, of central bank digital currency that is nanotech driven you know, we are totally expressing this in this day and time through a three-dimensional construct. But the way the Atlanteans had everything set up was that they moved through the natural order of things. So what do I mean by that? So for example, here at this particular time in 3D, we have harp now harp is a weather modification system that allows different uh systems to activate in different parts of the world once harp directs its pulse to that particular location the atlanteans they actually controlled the entities that created weather earth fire you know they actually were superior to these entities and these entities were basically un under under their domain and took orders from them in terms of what needed to be done and when so when you get into um the book of dijon there's one there's one area where it talks about the uh the breakdown and let me see if i can pull this up real quick Okay. Okay. And it says, um, well, she break she breaks down <laughs> the uh, the formation and the creation of of these beings that they really got very profoundly deep into, and one of the books. If you ever want to see this in in uh, 3D in terms of an artistic rendering, you want to see if you can find the book titled Milk and Honey, because that book is a pictorial creation of what transpired on Atlantis, and it's done by an artist who I was actually able to befriend. And many of you may know this artist or at least have seen his work. Uh, <laughs> if, if you're familiar with 
Santana Abraxas. He did the uh, album cover for that. If you're familiar with Miles Davis's Bitches Brew and Live <laughs> Evil, he did the paintings for that. You know, so if you can find this book, it will blow you away because in this book, he details an amazing artwork, all of what transpired during that time with the Atlanteans and this genetically engineered race that they began to integrate with. But wow, when you wow. look at this one piece, this one piece says, and with respect to what you just asked, it says, and the great king, and this is from the book of Dijon. It says, and the great king of the dazzling face, the chief of all the yellow face was sad seeing the sins of the black face. He sent his air vehicles, his vivans, to all his brother chiefs, chiefs of other nations and tribes, with men within saying, prepare, arise you men of the good law and cross the land while yet dry. The lords of the storm are approaching. Their chariots are nearing the land. One night and two days only shall the lords of the dark face, the sorcerers live on this patient land. She is doomed, and they have to descend with her. The nether lords of the fires, the gomes, and fire elementals are preparing their magic, their fire weapons worked by magic. But the lords of the dark eye, the evil eye, are stronger than they, the elementals. And they are the slaves of the mighty ones. So right there, you are being told that this one faction of the Atlantean culture, that they had steeped themselves and developed themselves to such an extent that the elementals, which oversaw and basically created the undergrid for how weather patterns formed, how the earth reshaped you know how the rains fell from the sky they were all under the influence of these beings and it goes on and it says that they are versed and asked Jarvidya the highest of magical knowledge come and use yours use your magic use your power in order to counteract those of the sorcerers. Let every lord of the dazzling face and adept of the higher magic cause the vivan of every lord of the dark face to come into his hands or possession. Least any of the sorcerers should by their means escape from the rising waters and avoid the rod of the karmic four. Wayne, and say, Wayne, yes. May I ask may you, I, not, not about the past, but the future. I just posted a link onto the room chat from the machine learning subreddit. The discussion of the. We're not doing that, guys. I will open up the floor for questions. Okay. Um, guys, listen, before you bring anybody up on stage, make sure you check their bio. Um, we don't want anybody on stage because everyone is. You know, y'all already know how this goes when we have a guest on here. No, no one is going to speak until I open up the floor um, for questioning. So, um, yeah, go ahead, Wayne. I'm sorry about that. Please continue. So it says, may every yellow face send sleep from himself to mesmerize to every black face. May even they, the sorcerers, avoid pain and suffering. May every man, true to the solar gods, bind every man under the lunar gods. 
least he should suffer or escape his destiny. And may every yellow face offer of his life water, his blood, to the speaking animal of a black face, least he awaken his master. The hour has struck. The black night is ready. Let their destiny be accomplished. We are the servants of the great four. May the kings of light return. The great king fell upon his dazzling face and wept. When the kings assembled, the waters had already moved. But the nations had now crossed the dry lands. They were beyond the watermark. Their kings reached them in their vilwans and led them on to the lands of fire and metal, the east and the north. In a later passage, it goes on and it says, the speaking beast, the magic watchers kept quiet. The netherlords waited for orders, but they came not, for their masters slept. The waters arose and covered the valleys from one end of the earth to the other. Highlands remained, the bottom of the earth, the land of the antipodes remained dry. There dwelt those who escaped, the men of the yellow faces and of the straight eye, the frank and sincere people. When the lords of the dark faces awoke and bethought themselves of their virwans in order to escape the rising waters, they found them gone. And then another passage, and this is the last one I'm going to uh, uh, deliver. It says, the stronger, more powerful of these magicians awoke earlier than the others, pursuing those who had exploit them and who were in the rear guard. For those nations that were led away were as thick as the stars of the Milky Way. Like as a dragon snake uncoils slowly its body, so the sons of men, led on by the sons of wisdom, opened their folds and spreading out, expanded like a running stream of sweet waters. Yet the pursuers, whose heads and chests soared high above the rising waters, chased them for three lunar terms until finally, reached by the rising waves, they perished to the last man, the soil sinking under their feet and the earth engulfing those who had desecrated her. So you get into this storyline that now begins to make sense when you talk about Noah. Um, when you hear the uh, the the, uh, the stories, you know of of um, the sea parting, and you know um, in 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 ancient uh, Kemet, and you you hear this this story of you know these people being moved through and out of one location, which in that time supposedly was Egypt, but it really wasn't Egypt. All of those storylines come way before what transpired historically during that time, that later time period. But with respect to earth changes, we've had several. And they're ongoing. You know, one of the things that I discuss in Ancient Future, I have a whole segment that talks about the shifting of the poles 
and how far back that goes into antiquity. You know, just when you look at the Great Pyramid, the Great Pyramid, one of the largest structures on the face of the earth, at the very top where they still have some of the casing stones, this one archaeologist by the name of Harold Getzinger literally pulled off aquatic crustaceans and carbon dated them, you know, to like 43,000 years prior to the building of the, the, uh, the pyramids. So the pyramid was literally underwater, which means that Egypt, Kemet, was underwater for a long time, you know? So we, we really don't know in terms of timelines, you know, what has transpired during this era and during the antediluvian world, which is literally translated as the world before the flood because there was an entirely new and different way of being, you know, during the antediluvian epoch. And what we're working with now is deeply and profoundly karmic. And that's why the remembrance of what has transpired prior to our arrival to our incarnation here during this time is so important, so imperative to understand because it has everything to do with how we will navigate our current reality in this particular uh, moment in history because we have profound challenges that are afoot and if we don't know, if we don't have an understanding of how to navigate that and secure ourselves from the inside out, then we're going to be uh, a doomed species. We're not going to make it out. Wow. Wow. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Wayne. A few questions. A few I'm questions. Gonna... I'm going to. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. Wow. You muted your mic. Okay. Perfect. So, wow. That was like, um, that is, that's the whole point that we're trying to get to right from the beginning to where we are now. And you've laid a pretty good foundation really quickly. Uh, Wayne, the book that you were reading from, was that the book of design? Was that the book you were reading from those passages? Cause I want to make sure that people have references so that if they want to, you know, uh, cross reference and, and pick up that information for themselves are able to do that. bottom right of the screen <laughs> that oh, like it. Yeah. <laughs> okay so yeah that was the book <laughs> that was the book of Dijon okay and um those were stanzas those, those were specific stanzas that I was reading from that book now what's really a story you know that is is really um fascinating to me is I had a friend and he was a mentor and really he, he was a brother that literally and i mean this in the literal sense taught me how to walk um but he would later go to india and there he studied um you know in in many of the temples but at one point he really wanted to further and deepen his study so he went into tibet and they allowed him entrance into Tibet where he studied uh, at one of the temples there. And after being there for a little less than a year, they took him downstairs into this underground library. They pulled out this book, which they said was the most sacred of all of their books. And I believe that it was probably the book of Dijon, but he told me they laid this huge book on the table and they looked at him and they said, 
this is your book. We're just holding it for you when you all awaken. Wow. Wow. That's, 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 that's super deep. Okay. So just for, okay. So I'm looking at the book of design, design on Amazon. It's the, the known text, the secret doctrine, additional sources, a life of, um, Madame Blavatsky is, um, a call of Cthulhu fiction. Am I looking at the wrong book? I feel like I'm looking at the wrong book. Bottom right of the screen. Right there. Unmute your mic. <laughs> there we so go. What, why does it keep doing that? No, I guess I have to unmute you because it's we just have the too technology, many, right? Yeah, if we have too many, like usually when we speak, we'll just mute up so that the other person can speak because if not, there's like feedback. And so I'm muting you so that I can speak because every time I speak when we're both are my got turn, we're I got away. you. Exactly. Okay. So yeah. So you have to like mute, unmute. That's yeah, that's why it keeps doing that. Because I'm okay. muting you. Yeah. So the, the one that I'm looking at online, I'm wondering, is it the right book? Because it's like the book of design, um, the known text, the secret doctrine, additional sources, a life of um Madame Blavatsky, Call of Cthulhu fiction. Is that it? I don't think that's it. That sounds like part of it, but okay. once again, um, what's the last uh, statement regarding fiction? Well, it's in um, like parentheses, so it says Call of Cthulhu fiction, but I'll find it. I'll find the book of design. I'll post it in for all the members of the Discord guys. I'll post, I'll find the, the right book. I'll sort it out. I'm passing because I'm really huge on references. You know what I'm saying? So um, listen, that's, guys. That's, it's the secret doctrine carries the uh, the stanzas of Dijon. I, I have that book and you weren't lying when you said people pick that book up. <laughs> it's so, that book is crazy. Okay. it That book is like literally, you will be stuck on two pages. Um, it is definitely not a book to read from cover to cover. I've read several chapters of it, um, I, you know, when she talks about the cosmic egg, all of that. But at the time, I wasn't ready. I did put it down, but I have the book. It's huge. It's on my bookshelf, and I'm going to revisit it um, in, in doses. You know what I'm saying? It's super um, advanced, and it's definitely for the adepts. You know what I'm saying? And I'm working my way up through that. But I um, appreciate that. I appreciate the reference. And so... Um, let me just, uh, switch the conversation a little bit, because I know that your time is limited and I want to, you know, be able to, um, get certain points out of you and then also, um, open up the stage so that people can ask you questions. Now, um, as we, we were talking about all of this that you've already laid as our beginnings, and it's hard to establish a timeline 100% because as history has been written and rewritten, it's, you know, they're purposefully hiding you know, um, archaeological evidence and, you know, the things that actually took place throughout history, even when you talked about the poles being shifted, you know, that's something that um, a lot of us are starting to, you know, become aware of, right? But when throughout history, these individuals that came down to our planet, right, when we talk about um, the book of Enoch and the Nephilim and, you know, the, the watchers and all of these, you know, the, the fallen angels and all of these things. Um, when we get into the giants, how does that fit into our human history? Um, briefly, if you will. Yeah, because I mean, we, we've always been giants. I mean, when you, when you look back on the time, see, this is, this is the thing. See, a lot of people, Again, we have to deal with these fraudulent timelines. So the timeline that's been given us for Atlantis is really what they call Plato's Atlantis, you know, and Plato's Atlantis was a continent called Poseidonus. And with Poseidonus, that was only about 12,000 you know, uh, BCE. But when you look at the actual, real, authentic continent civilization of Atlantis, it was submerged 
800,000 years ago. That's almost a million years that it went under. Now, when you look at the fact that in that last passage that I read of the dazzling face and them coming and the watchers and coming to deal karmically with those that had desecrated the earth, we're talking about ETs because there was always a relationship with those high civilizations of Atlantis with those extraterrestrial. You know, that contact was always there. It's only been of late during our particular, the latter part of this epoch, that all of that has been like, wow, well, let's back off and let's give uh, this experience time to germinate and see what it produces, because uh, this is a wacky world. So I believe that the giants have always been a part of our reality. But when you get into pole shifting, this, this is what is so significant about the reversal of the axis. Because when the axis shift and reverse, then how life expands reverses. So when the pole shifted the last time, and that pole shift was 12,500 years ago, you had more of a diminutive stature that was formed in humanity because of the spin of the earth. Because when the poles shift, that spin is reversed. And that frequency that is generated from that spin is either going to dictate an expansive quality for life on the earth or diminutive quality for life on the earth. And we're going in the opposite direction. And that's why human beings have really shrunken in stature. But giants have always been part and parcel, you know, to the history of, of, of uh, civilization on this planet. I mean, even like Clifford L. Burdick in the uh, 1950s was doing research um, in a dried riverbed called the Paloxy Riverbed. And this was really profound because what he discovered were these, as he stated, formidable footprints of a human being that was walking in this area that was now this dried riverbed. But what was even more profound was that walking next to him were dinosaur footprints. And he may cast of these, you know, molds of these footprints and sent them around the world to every scientific laboratory to have them validated and have them discussed in some of the scientific journals. But you know what? They just disappeared. Like many of the other evidence in terms of giant species that you know wandered the earth during those times of course of course we just um i just had a room a couple days ago uh where i had a brother rod hayes on here and you know during my research i found out that there was a whole smithsonian cover-up about the giants right and um you know it was alluded to that you know it's in order to keep us from knowing basically our human um what our origins are and you know um the fact that you know that we're not actually evolving <laughs> and that we're in a de-evolutionary process which makes sense to me like i've been saying this for years you know if you think about 
who we were and these cosmic beings, now we're in these, you know, in these um, very fragile bodies dealing with duality, right? And capable of many great things, but also capable of the opposite of those great things, right? Um, so it, it definitely, and you just, all you have to do is just be an observer, a watcher, right? And then you can just look around and see basically what is going on with humanity. There's no way that we are at the height of who we are. And so that's actually the perfect segue um, into the next question that I want to ask you. Can you talk to us? I know you're very well versed and very well um, done a lot of studies um, on the the different ages that we go through and the different epochs. You've mentioned the word epoch a few times. Can you break down to, because I believe, you know, what I've been saying is that we're, I feel things, I channel information, you know what I mean? So I don't have all of the data that you have, but I just know that we are at now a crossroads, right? Well, let's say a, a fork in the road, right? That if we don't shift the consciousness of humanity, that we're gonna go down one path. And if we do, then we'll go down another path. And each one of these roads will take us, you know, one road will lead to dystopia and the other road will lead us to um, a new golden age. You know, what are your thoughts about that? And can you share with us the science of the different yugas that we're, um, that we experience on earth? Yeah. Um, the yuga that we're in right now uh, is, is called the, the, uh, the Cali in, um, the, uh, the ancient, uh, traditions of, of, uh, ancient India. Um, and the Kali is, is very unique. The, the first, the first of the yugas is the uh, the Krita or, or the Satya Yuga, and that Yuga lasts uh, for about one million seven hundred and uh, twenty eight uh, thousand years, and it's considered to be um, the Golden Age, uh, an age of enlightenment, an age of truth, purity. Uh, the second of those ages is the Treta Yuga which lasts for 1,296,000 years. And, you know, it, it also is an age of expansion, also an age of purity, uh, balance, but it's less perfected, you know, than, than the first. And then the third age is the uh, Dwapara, the uh, Dwapara Yuga, which lasts for 864,000 years. And it's characterized by the emergence of um, conflicting forces, you know, um, forces that uh, in that cycle begin to create inharmonious accords and eventually, you know, exhibits this struggle between that which is or how it's perceived as the high and the low, the good and the evil. And then you move into the fourth of these uh, ages, which is the Kali. Now, what is really deep about the Kali is that the Kali began in about, uh, about one, about, uh, 13004, um, or I'm sorry, 3104 uh, uh, BC. Um, we look for the beginning, you know, of uh, the Kali Yuga. But the thing with the Kali Yuga that makes it very unique is that it has, like a lot of people right now, are waiting for this age of light the return of, you know, these angelic symbolic forces. Um, others refer to it as Christ consciousness, but basically this enlightened state that will engulf all of humanity. And the thing with the Kali is that it literally has 
all of the other ages. Now, the Kali is the age of darkness. It's the age of despicability. It's the age of a draconian, nefarious consciousness that is all about the manipulation, you know, of humanity, the direction of humanity. There is nothing. If you stop and you look at the environment in which you live right now, when you look at the earth, the one thing that is profoundly lacking everywhere you look is a spiritual fabric. There's no spiritual fabric that is binding in the planet that allows human consciousness to ascend in the ways that it was designed to ascend and to have those specific types of personalities, sentient entities in charge to make sure that humanity is moving towards a greater expression and refinement of itself, they're not there. They're not there. You know, so when you look at what took place, one of the things that happened, when you look at the Mayan uh, calendar, the Mayan fifth world ended in 1987. And between 1987 and 2011 was a period that, you know, was pretty much one that denoted the need to make a choice. The energy frequencies were all over the place. And it was up to individuals in, in, in the human collective to determine what it was they wanted to do, where they wanted to go, where they wanted to go up or down, right or left. The sixth world, the Mayan sixth world began in 2012. Now, in 2012, we had all of these movies and, 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 and a lot of dialogue regarding the end of time. But what the Mayans were saying had nothing to do with time as we understand it, as we frame it. It had everything to do with frequency. So they were saying that it was the end of three dimensional time that frequencies were going to download onto the planet that were going to accelerate how humanity responded to cosmological force and direction so the deep thing about the sixth world the Mayans say that the sixth world is blank and it's up to us to create as co-creators the direction, the cultivation of the world and the reality that we want to navigate. Do you think, do you think do you think, do you that's, think that's, 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 that's hold on? I gotta mute you. Do you think that that's the reason why the um, quote unquote powers that be um, at this particular time in history, you know, hit us with um, you know this COVID, the Great Reset um, Agenda Twenty One that is now turning to Agenda Twenty Thirty because they understand the um, occult nature of what has taken place, the metaphysics of it, they understand history, the very tools that they have been using, the knowledge and science that they've been using, which they got from our ancients to run the world and to stay in power. And they know that that they're at risk at this point of losing rulership. Um, they know that this blank slate is there. So they're trying to create an imprint to bring us into this new, um, you know this new age they're trying to create what hasn't been created 
by bringing in artificial intelligence. What are your thoughts on that? And then um, we're going to shift the conversation because I know we could be here all day. I got a million questions for you, but I know that your time is limited. So yeah, what do you think about that? So that's on point, very much on point. You know, one of the things, and you know, I don't, I don't, cause I know a lot of people, I have family, I have friends, you know, that have, you know, received uh, the shot. Um, but there's a lot that's going on right now that is so karmically wrapped up in what constitutes the direction of humanity. And so I could go off in a multitude of different directions and breaking that down, but the end game of all of this is really centered around what's called the VMAT2 gene. And many of us refer to that gene as the God gene. And the God gene is what is in peril right now because that is our connection as transmitters and as receivers for these cosmological forces that are now being downloaded onto the planet for us to take that repattern ourselves with those frequencies be able to address the various timelines because there are a multitude of different timelines that are now being manifested in this reality. But you have to do the specific practices to lock in to those specific timelines or your specific timeline that resonates with you and for you. And it's all based on holographics. It's all based on the nature of the universe is holographic and the timelines that are now moving through our current reality are there for us to lock into integrate with to create the kind of realities that we want to have but once the god gene is taken offline once that happens we no longer become the transmitters we no longer become the available uh, recipients of this vibrational energy that cosmologically is being downloaded onto the planet. So to answer your question, <laughs> yeah, they know. <laughs> that, so um, so um, my, my next question is this. I remember, you know, we've known each other for years, right? And of course, you know that um, I listened to a lot of Bobby Hemet's teachings, right? And so one day um, I was listening to Bobby Hemet and he was talking about the gods, you know, how we are the gods and the gods are here on the planet and things of that nature. And then he spoke, he told a story about this guy um, that got, you know, he, that got walked out in front of a vehicle and got hit, you know, by this vehicle, flew up into the air and landed on his feet like a superhero. And I was like, oh my God. But then he said the guy's name and the guy was you. <laughs> so I was like, what? You know what I mean? I gotta call him. So um, I did call you, remember that conversation? And I'm like, okay, what the hell? You know what I'm saying? And so can you talk to the people about your practices and what you've been doing over the years to, um, you know, a little bit about Qi energy, your Qigong practices, and you know how, because guys, this is about solutions, right? We've gone through the conversation, you know, and, and I am gonna open up the floor in just a few minutes, you know, for um, questions and things of that nature. But, you know, this is, we wanna go full spectrum here because we, you know, he's spoken about these different things, but how, what are we supposed to do next, right? And it, you know, one of the things that I feel that's important for us to know as far as practices is about qigong and i'm not nowhere close to being a qigong master or anything like that i've been a recipient of the healing um energetically from um brother wayne and you know i have also done qigong practices just from youtube and stuff like that and it does balance your energy out so can you talk to the people about that and what is it tell us about that experience when you got hit by a car 
and you got bit, hit by a car, what kind of force field do you have around you that you were not hurt, that you were able to fly up into the air and then just basically land back down on your feet? Bottom right corner. <laughs> He's trying to unmute his mic, guys. This is his first time on Clubhouse. So the bottom right corner. Everybody. Got it. Okay. So, yeah, that um, experience, first, <laughs> first let me clarify. I did not walk out in front of a car. I was actually getting ready to get into my car um, I had a friend with me. I was driving up from Tuskegee, Alabama, um, and I stopped, picked up a friend in D.C. because I knew she would be the only person that would be awake at that time. So she was making moves with me as I was traveling around the city um, doing, uh, you know, chores, picking up stuff, you know, stuff that I can't get up here where I live. And <laughs> I was getting into the, the, the on the driver's side, I uh, popped the, pop the clock, popped the clock, the, uh, the, uh, the door so that she could get in. And, um, When I got ready to open my car door, I got hit by a Ford Explorer SUV. And it knocked me, it knocked me about three car lengths forward and about 15, 20 feet up in the air. And um, when I was up there, I mean, it was an, an amazing experience, and I was upside down, but time had shifted. Time had really just moved into a different frequency altogether, and so I was able to look at what was happening in real time, but from a very transcendent place so i looked at the sky and i said wow sky is so blue you know and then the next thought that came to my mind was wow this is what it feels like to fly and then the next thought that came to my mind was wow i'm flying I'm upside down, how am I going to land? And the next thing that happened was I flipped. My body just flipped in the air and I landed on my toes, knees bent and my fingertips. And the people who were around just completely and totally freaked out. And so I stood up and everybody bum rushed me and dragged me back down on the ground. Get down, get down. And I said to myself, wow, you know, like, I, that, there must be something wrong, you know, because I just got hit. Because I didn't know what had happened at first. The impact was so just intense. And it wasn't until I was up floating and flying through the air that I recognized the fact that I had been hit by, by a vehicle. And I laid there in the street for a couple of minutes. But while I laid there, you know, I mean, the only reason that I stood up after I flipped and landed, the only reason I stood up was because I had already gone inside my body and had checked for damage. There was no damage. So wow. I stood up. And, but then, you know, it was, 
when we look at fear and how fear is transferred, it's it's really it it's it's amazing, you know, because that's what everybody else's fear like was directed at me and i really absorbed that for a minute and actually laid down in the street like an idiot <laughs> and, uh, until i'm laying there and i'm then i go man you know there's nothing wrong with you stand your ass up and get on the sidewalk and so that's what i did you know i got up went and just sat down on the ledge you know on the sidewalk and uh this policeman who was off duty was there and saw the whole thing he came over he said you you know you you good you okay and i'm like yeah yeah you know and he said man i've been a police officer for 25 years and in 25 years i ain't never seen no shit like that and i said <laughs> I said, yeah, well, I've never experienced anything like that. But um, Qigong, like really, you know, it's amazing. It's my life. It's my life in the sense that it allows me to integrate with all aspects and factions of our current reality and move me beyond the reality that I have to deal with in practical ways on a daily basis. You know, like I do my practices every day, every day. And if something happens or comes up where I cannot do my practices on that particular given day, I feel naked when I go out, even though I know I'm not. Because I know that <laughs> when you've put in the time and the study, and the effort and the levels of cultivation that I have put in, you know, to develop my chi body, that I'm okay, I'm good. But one of the things, when I move out into the world, I always use what's called Kachari Mudra. And Kachari Mudra is tongue connection. And tongue connection is what connects the main energetic circuits in the human body. And once those circuits are created, it generates a force field around the body. And if you're doing practice, that force field just solidifies more and more and becomes, even in its solidification, becomes more and more resilient and so it's able to expand when it needs to it's able to contract when it needs to you know so if there's somebody around me for example who is giving off really toxic energy all i have to do is think a thought and just fold my arms across my chest and my feel shrinks and collapse. But the thing is, with respect to practices like that during these times, it can be easily explained away by just one phrase. The only way out is in. And that's it. Oh, wow. wow, wow, powerful. That's super powerful. Whoo, that's a lot, guys. And that's a that's a real story. Like, um, I heard that story from Bobby Hemet. And like I said, the Qigong um is, you know, something that I have experienced at a distance, you know, um where, you know, Wayne's done healing work on me um during a particularly difficult time in my life, you know. And so like I said, he's been there. You know, I know him personally and I've had an opportunity to really just you know, as I was, had all these amazing questions, you know, like have this person I could just dial up on the phone and said, hey, this is what I'm thinking about. What do you think, you know, about this? And so, you know, that's helped me along in my personal journey as well. Um, guys, listen, I have his link posted at the top. If you want to get in contact with um, Brother Wayne Chandler, 
Um, that is his website. Okay. And so if you want to become like a part of, um, you know, uh, his practices or you need some energetic work or anything like that. And it's, it's not just what you hear on the internet is that we, this is a, this is not the work culture. I'm sorry, the woke, the woke culture. It's not that this is not YouTube university. This is a real adept, you know, a scholar or someone that has been studying it. If you guys came to the room later, you must absolutely go back and listen to the replays. It's going to, this episode is going to be up on the podcast. So make sure you're following the matrix on veil. Make sure you follow the podcast. If you're not following the club, follow the club, follow myself, turn my bell on to always. So you will never miss amazing rooms like this. Make sure you give brother Wayne a follow and follow all the moderators on the stage, you know? Um, but Wayne, you have a retreat coming up. I'm about to open. I'll wait to get to that in a moment, but guys, that's how you can connect with him by clicking on his website. He's also on Facebook. He is not a huge social media person um, because he's out here doing the things, living life and, you know, actually helping to shift the grid, you know, with his actions and with the information and the workshops that he does every single year. You know, he does um, workshops, um, hands-on retreats in many different locations, you know, Jamaica, Costa Rica, different places. This year, he's going to be going to Mexico. Um, so definitely tap in with him for that. But I do want to go ahead and open up the floor for questions, guys. Please be respectful. This is a very rare opportunity. This man does not go everywhere, you know. Uh, so it's a very unique experience to actually have him here on Clubhouse to be able to interact and ask questions. But yes, who would like to ask a question to a Brother Wayne? The floor is open. Lisa, this is Lisa. Um, hi, Wayne. I really don't have a question, but I have a statement. And what you just said is absolutely true. I have been in class with Wayne Chandler, and he is absolutely the truth. You feel like a different human <laughs> after he's done and the things that he can do is utterly shocking and um i practice with him whenever he's in chicago and go to his website do anything you can with him because it will change all of your molecules and uh with that i relinquish the mic that's all i had to say thank you lisa Anyone have a question for Wayne? If you have a question for Wayne, guys, just tap your mics and I'll call on one of you. Okay, so Anthea, go ahead. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you for hosting this space and inviting Brother Chandler to to Clubhouse. Uh, Brother Chandler, thank you for your continuing your continual efforts for doing the inner work and your tireless uh, spreading of your wisdom. You, you're a living legend to me. I've spoken to you before. I don't know whether you remember me. My question is this: I'm a Montessori practitioner, and I always speak about protecting the spontaneous manifestations of children. Could you speak about what you would advise? parents to do in regards to protecting that child's spontaneous manifestations I think the educational system does uh, you know a hell of a hell of a job uh, with with our children and I just would like to, to hear from you what your perspectives are on the protection of uh, the child's natural being thank you yeah, I believe right now that homeschooling is probably one of the strongest um, tools for self-cultivation when it comes to that. Um, that's something that is a necessity to be em employed um, when the child, if they're in school, when they get home, there has to be some exchange between the child and his parents in terms of transmitting um, authentic information, you know, and not just lamb blasting the child with that information, but actually sitting with the child and listening, asking, well, what did you learn today? And then being able to go in with, you know, a critical approach, you know, in terms of just thinking critically you know, what they receive and how in line that is with their own personal development and their own personal growth. Those are the things that are imperative right now, you know, in terms of just creating a strong bond in our 
generations. You know, there's, um, if I can, uh, if I can remember uh, this quote, it's, um, it is said that what is called the spirit of an age is something to which one cannot return. That this spirit dissipates is due to the world's coming to an end. Though one would like to change today's world back to the spirit of 5,000 years ago or more, it cannot be done. Therefore, we must make the best out of every generation. And that's an old ancient um, Japanese text, but it speaks to the need of focusing on the generations that are going to be out front and creating our tomorrows. And if we can't nurture, refine, and cultivate them properly, then our tomorrow is dim. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, anyone else? Um, next question, guys, just tap your mics and I will go ahead and call on you. Do you have a question for Brother Wayne? Okay, so I think it's uh, Madaraki. Mm -hmm. Go ahead with your question. Uh, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you so much. I appreciate um, you, Lisa, and um, Brother Wayne. I really appreciate you coming on. And I'm glad I was able to be here. Uh, peace to the room, everyone. Um, um, I'm actually um, in the process of a book um, that I wanted to, to kind of use to help connect people back to their chi, which um, I kind of have been known as a, somewhat of an energy healer myself, but I know I, I want to do more work in terms of, um, I guess the chi gong seems like something, but it is, is is that um, how you like did your practices? Is qigong the only way? Because I also know of you know like in our culture and um, the Igbo culture that I know that we tend to kind of focus on qi, but it seems like people only know of the Asian methods. And I, I guess I was just curious if you have any other methods of, of things and um, and um, how do I get into your program and stuff like that? Hey, well, wait, before you answer yeah. that question. Um, can we just like talk about how the ancient culture of Asia? Yeah, is... I'm getting ready to do that. Yes, yeah, that's please, what I want to know more about. <laughs> yeah, so when we when we go back historically and we look at the genesis of you know many of the cultures of the ancient world, especially those that took the banner of civilization and expanded that and created a global template that all others would follow, you're looking at um, an influence that is uh, African-centered. You know, so the first dynasties in China, which was the Zi dynasty and the Shang dynasty, um, you're looking at, you know, black dynasties. And they literally laid the foundation of culture in China that persists to this very day. Um, I've written extensively on that. As a matter of fact, we did a, a book when I was working and writing for uh, Dr. Van Sertema out of Rutgers University. We did a book called The African Presence in Early Asia. And it goes in and illuminates, you know, that body of information that shows that the first dynasties of China were black. The first dynasties, civilizations of India were black. The first dynasties, civilizations of Southeast Asia were black. So when you talk about, um, Asian culture, and you're talking about the science that evolved from that, you're really talking about black science, you know, and black culture. 
you know, because that's where it began. And that's one of the things that, you know, basically in, in a large extent, you know, is not known. So, for example, you said uh, you're Igbo? I, I am. I, I am. Okay. So, your system, your, your system, I talked about the yugas. I talked about the four stages, you know, and cycles that we undergo. This being the Kali. Now, I can go into your culture, which is what I really should have done anyway. And the first of those cycles is called the Uga Aka. And the Uga Aka deals with pure spirit and immortality. The second of those cycles is called the Uga Chi. And the Uga Chi deals with duality, intuition, and telepathy, but it's the first cycle where death makes itself known. The third cycle is called the Uga Anwu. And the Uga Anwu deals with the children of light, the children who express and reflect the one eye. And at that particular point, at the latter part of that particular cycle, that's when you begin to see, you know, these destructive energies that are now beginning to manifest. And then the fourth cycle, which corresponds to the Kali, is the Uga Azi. And the Uga Azi deals with ignorance evil and confusion as it covers the earth so there's a blending you know because in with the ancient blacks in india they referred to them as yugas with a y but in your culture it's just uga u g a you know but it says the exact same thing so all information that is utilized, functional, and pervasive in terms of high culture and expanded transcendent consciousness has its base, its root from all of what I've been able to see in Africa. That does not mean that it has not been embellished in various ways as those particular specific cultures embrace those tools, those forms, you know, of, of uh, spirit, spirituality and, you know, added their own uh, flavor to them. I understand. Yeah, yeah. And I appreciate you saying this because I do, know what you're talking about, the Ogazi and Oganya and all that kind of stuff. Um and I I I'm I've I've dived into it but I'm interested in learning more so that um uh, my work also can, you know, be more um effective as well and as my own personal development. I appreciate you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you Madaraki. So guys I just want to say this really quickly. Um before I move to the next question is this like we have to if we're going to um, think about transcendence, right, and bring in like oneness, um, we have to somehow figure out a way within ourselves internally to rise above separation. You know what I'm saying? Um, and this is this, that's that, because you know, at the beginning, it was the all, right? There was this was the all, and so out of the all came everything. Okay, so you know all the stuff down here. You know, if, you know, listen, science has said that the oldest bones that they have found on earth, at least to my knowledge, has been, you know, um, a black woman. Okay. So we don't want to make this about race or anything like that, because at the end of the day, you know, archaeological evidence and history proves different things. You know, all it takes is just not all it takes, because I know that's why I have this club to bring awareness, you know, to people of, you know, different things and his historical events around the world 
that changes the current paradigm, you know, the current narrative and paradigm of which we live in. So you, you got to know, you know what I'm saying? Like I told you um, about Nagajuna. So um, the Africans in Asia with, um, you know, I forget this guy's name, Eugene Adams, right? That I saw on YouTube. So he, there's a book called Africans in Asia. So, I mean, if we understand like the sand people, how they are the ones that actually created, you know, like migrated into different places. So we just got to learn our history and, you know, know that, you know, nothing, there's nothing down here that we can't tap into. So I just wanted to put that out there, guys. Um, go ahead and flash your mics if you have a question for Brother Wayne. I don't have a question, Lisa. I just want to say. And he is flashing. That's awesome. What did you say, Jerry? I don't have a question, but just listening to Wayne mm -hmm. speak, like I can't, I couldn't leave this room. Uh, I'm doing something in the back <laughs> I couldn't leave. I really appreciate uh, Wayne, you coming on here and telling your story, especially the last one. It's just, it makes me think a lot and I, and I appreciate you for being here. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Yeah, Brother Wayne is amazing. Y'all got to tap into him for real. What I'm telling you, like he is um, a griot. You know, he has a book. Um, you can find it on Amazon. It's called Ancient Future. Make sure you guys go ahead and pick that book up. And, you know, if you weren't here at the very beginning of the room, when, I mean, his, his knowledge and scholarship, I mean, he worked personally with um, Dr. Ivan Van Sertima, right? And, you know, his books and they came before Columbus and all that stuff that you guys are reading. This is someone that was there, you know, and his knowledge base is completely, you know, far beyond anything that you're going to ever get on YouTube. This room is so special. Y'all have no idea, you know, like what's actually taking place here. This is one for the um, the history books. Dr. Um, Dr. <laughs> Brother Wayne Chandler here on Clubhouse is amazing. So, guys, the floor is open. Flash your mics, though, um, if you have a question to ask. Okay, so I see Aurelius, and then I'm going to come to you next, Ramal. Uh, um, Aurelius, go ahead. Peace to the flow. Peace, peace. This is like, this is a hot topic. It is a true hot topic, and a uh, peace uh, for you coming. Honestly, you, Mr. Brother Wayne. And uh, I, I got in kind of late, but I heard some of the base topic of the conversation. And, uh, you know, I kind of like study in this field as well, you know, from the history of the Maya Nagas and the Serpent Mounds and the, and the ancient Hindus going into you know the Wuxian dynasties and the, we talk about the serpents and um I wanted to like talk touch in on some of those um historical sites that um I don't know if you t went over it already about like you know like a lot of the, the Hopi mounds and uh, the Cahokia mounds and those parks in uh, Mexico I think it's some, some Sonoga Park where they have the dragon mounds right and we get into that serpent talk I don't know if you guys got into that into that old calendar system when it bases the lunar calendar we're talking about a lot of the, um, the mounds that were built here falling to some of the ancient ancestry. And I, I love to hear it because, like, when you hear the story of, like, how the Hindus brought it, it goes back into the Mayans. And then you go into this classical Mayan, this Naga Mayan serpent thing. And then you fall into a lot of the divine Naga serpent in Egypt as well. And, like, a lot of people kind of get, you know, some of it kind of like misconstrued i don't know where the direction did it actually come from but to hear you kind of like bring some of those points up you know kind of like encourage me to keep study up and uh keep that information going and uh you know if i pick some of the interesting conversations to try to speak on or if you see where i need any correction or any guidance on where i'm headed in this information i'd love to hear some but um some of the information about the pliocene and the calavera skull of 1866 where they where they so-called florin dated back 438 million years where it says that um we were supposed to be like um descendants of giants you know this is where you get to the giants and the serpent mounds and the, and the and canaanites and uh, whatever uh, other names you have for these giant people but they were references as women too so i just dropped some of the bars there you know kind of sparks your mind up or uh, people to the floor i mean i'm pretty sure some people already heard me talk about this but uh, it's great to hear that you know and it's, it's good for us to kind of circle that in to see like a lot of that science coming from the origin and you fall into those mounds too and what's funny about those mounds they speak about a lot of the writing the paleo writing and we talk about paleo Aurelius. Aurel do you have a question well i was asking him, like how does you feel about a lot of the information about what's being said about the hopi and like a lot of the paleo scripts that are in like cleveland and the mississippi how they speak about those writings being like forty thousand years old from the paleo hebrew the paleo greek 
Paleo Egyptian. A lot of those writings coming from out of there. And how does he feel about that too? Just kind of like, cause I wasn't sure what he what he covered. So you know, just kind of drop some topics out there. Brother Rain, you got the mic. Bottom right. <laughs> Gotta unmute your mic. There we go. So, so yeah, you know, um, again, you know, we're 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 looking at, you know, fraudulent timelines because, you know, it's 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 a very narrow window, you know, for um, our current civilization and for different factions within the civilization, you know, to make sense of, 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 of their presence. So the timelines have all been manipulated, um, have all been readjusted, you know? So when you start looking back on what has really transpired historically, I mean, you, you'd be amazed. There's a book that, uh, for those of you who might be able to find this book, I'm pretty sure it's still in print. Um, and you can probably get it on Amazon. It's called Forbidden Archaeology. And it's called The, uh, the, uh, the Hidden History of the Human Race. And in this, in, in this particular book, they go deep into just what has been found all over uh, the planet, you know, in terms of our Native American cultures, um, where, where they have found uh, a shoe print that, I mean, not, not a footprint, but a shoe, a shoe print that goes back like, you know, 50, 50 million years. Um, as a matter of fact, if I can pull this up real quick, but in terms of the Hopi, you know, one of the things that, because I have gone through those, those areas in, in the Southwest and have sat and talked to a couple of uh, Hopi elders, and when you listen to their predictions, their prophecies, for where we are now, what we're getting ready to go through, and how we will come out on the other end, it all once again goes back to the only way out is in. Because one of their prophecies is there will come to be a tear in the fabric of time there will come to be a tear in the fabric of time and those who have prepared themselves will be able to walk right through so when you hear things like that and that's just a fragment of information that i've received from them but it speaks to these timelines that I was talking about earlier that we have to learn how to tap into. And the only way we can do that is through self-cultivation practices, you know, because that's where it is right now. You know, I mean, I've traveled the world and I've been to Kemet everywhere, you know, uh, India, but it's all about your temple. Now, that's what's the most important is your temple and the cultivation, expansion and refinement of your temple. I had a problem with my microphone. I got to mute you, Wayne. For some reason, every time I speak and we're both unmuted, I'm getting some feedback. So, um, perfect, perfect, perfect. Um, there was someone else on the stage that had a question. It was, I don't it was, see her on the Naira. It was me as well. Okay, who was me? Uh, Ramal. 
What's your name? Ramal. Ramal, you were next. Go ahead, Ramal. That sounds like that Chris, uh, what is it called? Chris Tucker. Who is me? I'm me. <laughs> <laughs> Who is you? Go ahead, go ahead Ramal. What's your question? Uh, peace, peace, y'all. I just want to say real quick, uh, uh, Mr. Wayne, it is a pleasure to meet you and be uh, in the same space as you. Um, I was in your, uh, what do you call it, um, your Qigong class that you had through Black Magic 363's channel. Um, I currently even in, have incorporated a new breathing practice listening to you. Uh, I've been doing Qigong for a while. Everything you said was just uh, confirmation. And uh, your book, uh, Ancient Future, is one of the most profound books I've ever read. Uh, it is a demonstration of it's not how many books you read, but what books you read, right? Uh, I've only read a couple books, but yours, uh, the fact that I even came into it uh, was just, you know, spirit guiding me. And it's uh, it's a book to be read multiple times. I'm trying to still synthesize it. And there's so many different questions I could ask you that come from this book. But one, one in particular, because I don't think a lot of us, uh, it's not common understanding of these uh, hermetic axioms right these seven hermetic laws uh people might have heard of them but i don't think we truly understand them and you man there's just there's so many different uh, dimensions that you go into about these axioms but what i wanted to ask you is just like how you have the uh you have the memory the story of you getting hit by that car um can you speak on which axiom or which hermetic law do you think um I mean, if you had to talk about one in your experience, which would it be and, and what happened? <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's a great question, man. That's a great question. Um, if I had one that I really needed to elaborate on and to sell, you know, uh, like just say to the the larger body of, of humanity it would be it would be the law of vibration because vibration like encapsulates frequency what is so relevant and pertinent right now in our everyday existence with the downloads that we're getting from the universe and what we get from other individuals, you know, that we come in contact with on a daily basis. You know, what we get when we go and sit into meditation and what we get when we actually perform the practices to elevate our frequencies. So vibration right now is the most relevant of uh, those principles and that's the one i would sell more than any other all right, all right. Ramal. Ramal, did you have a follow I, I was just saying i appreciate, appreciate that brother uh, brother wayne and you know what shout out to you you know what i'm saying for like investing in yourself and taking that workshop and you know continuing the, to actually apply the practices guys that's what it takes you know, attend the workshops, you know, um, buy the books, you know, do the things, right? And then, you know, then apply the practices. So shout out to you, brother, for doing that. Uh, appreciate you being here in the space. Guys, just a quick reminder, if you're not already following the club, go ahead and click that little greenhouse at the top, Matrix Unveiled. That is my club. Follow the club, add some friends to the club. Make sure you click on my face, give myself a follow, turn the bell by my name as always because huh, we always have the most amazing rooms on Clubhouse, okay, period. Make sure you give Wayne a follow and follow all the moderators on the stage. With that being said, the next question is to Queen Myra. Then we're going to take like about two more questions after that, guys. And then we're going to um, go ahead and let the brother leave because I know he has things to do. So, uh, Naira, are you there? Yes, hi. <clears throat> Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Brother Wayne. Um, for the opportunity. So I have a question. Is it possible that the pyramids off the coast of Cuba and the pyramids um, in like close to the Bermuda Triangle, is that possible? Is it possible that that could be Atlantis, like the whole greater Annalise? Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. You know, um, I mean, they they found, uh, you know, pyramids all over the planet. And 
you know, they've done the best that they could possibly do in trying to, um, you know, discourage scientists and archaeologists, you know, from writing about them. But, oh, man, I mean, there are two aquatic uh, archaeologists, um, if I can get their name, it was uh, Paul uh, Weinswig, Paul Weinswig and Pauline Zelitsky. Now, they were doing um, aquatic research off of the coast of Cuba. And this was back in the uh, early 90s. And they discovered on the seafloor an entire pyramid complex. And they were so blown away by what they had seen that they knew that they could come up, go to National Geographic, go to the Smithsonian. They said all they needed was a million dollars to finish their research. Do you think they got it? No, they didn't get a penny. And everywhere they went, they could not get the funding that they needed to complete the uh, archaeological research that they were doing, you know, on, 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 on those uh, sites. Now, the thing that <laughs> is, is, is really profound is that those areas definitely are all part of the Atlantean plate. And there are other areas that also carry, you know, a strong Atlantean presence. And you can actually go in different areas of the world and, and find, I mean, Antarctica, there are like three pyramids in Antarctica that I've actually got video footage that was taken of them that is completely and totally amazing and showing, you know, the armed forces converging on these uh, pyramids because it was actually taken. And that's the thing with these phones, you know, now nothing is secret anymore. So one of the, uh, you know, uh, our armed force uh, individuals actually took the footage of what they were doing from the plane coming in and landing to them trekking up to these pyramids. And he took the footage of all of that. And it's an amazing thing, you know, to behold. So what what we see right now in the world around us is complete and total illusion and because of the depth of the illusion it creates delusion and we live with and in that on a daily basis and now the times we're in we've got to wake up because <laughs> They're coming for us, you know, I mean, they're coming, you know, my investment program, WBC, uh, and we meet every Sunday night and we deal with the issues of how to create abundance, you know, financially. And one of the things that has come up in the research that we present are these central bank digital currencies that are about to flood the planet. And these central bank digital currencies are nanotech driven. They have biosensory mechanisms within them and, and an innate payment system that will pay you. But the thing about these particular coins is that they have an expiration date. So they actually can only be used for a short period of time before they no longer 
are relevant, spendable, usable. And the reason that they're designed like that is so that you can't even begin to think about establishing and building and creating generational wealth. You're literally stuck in one place financially for the rest of your life. So there are so many things that are forming right now that are creating a perfect storm. And once again, it goes back to what we did on Atlantis that is now flipping the script on us. And this is part of what we have to deal with in terms of rectification. And that's why remembering right now is so imperative, so urgent, and it's, it's so like critical, important. We have to remember so that we know what we have to do and how we have to do it. Facts. I remember I you remember telling me years ago, you know, about what was to come. You did. And, you know, I was a little flipping about it, you know, um, like, yeah, 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 you know, but Wayne's like everything that we're doing now, like all the conversations we've been having on Clubhouse about food shortages, you know, about COVID diseases, all that stuff, and blockchain technology, um, you know, the pr rising prices of gold, all gas, all of that. Like we were having these conversations back in 2014, 2015, and he was telling me of what was to come, you know, so definitely he's super tapped in guys we're going to take like two more questions and guys stick around because we're, we are going to have um you know an after show so that you know um we can discuss like basically and unpack you know all, all the things that we heard here today but let's do two more questions for wayne because uh, i know that he has to go so flash your mic if you have a question hey brother wayne thank you so much for your input um i have two questions um the first question is, what is your thoughts on Adam's calendar and um, the ancient technologies or the ancients with regards to, I know you mentioned the the pyramids, so I wanted to get your thoughts on the Adam's calendar with everything that you said. And then the final thing is, what is your thoughts on the flat earth? Where does it stand with everything that you've just spoken about? When you look at calendars, the calendar that's broken down, divided into 28 days and 13 months. That is the original calendar that was divine, uh, divine, yeah, because it, it was divine, but that was um, devised to integrate human consciousness with fourth dimensional reality because we live a three dimensional existence, but that's not who and what we are. We're fourth dimensional beings. So the oldest of the calendars that we know of that are designed like that is the Ethiopian calendar. And that calendar extends down into how it was utilized, not only in South Africa, but in antiquity, also in Kemet, in um, Southern Arabia, that calendar was the template that would later create the Mayan calendar. But most people identify with the Mayan calendar and have completely stepped away from those older calendars that were utilized in Ethiopia, you know, or Kush, Kemet, Egypt. You know, those calendars created the basis for a technology, a cosmological technology that no longer exists. 
we are fourth dimensional beings. That's why you have the chakra systems in your body. That's why you have meridians or nadis that transfer, transmute, and transmit higher frequencies that takes one into higher consciousness. It's because those systems being in the body is an obvious reflection of who and what we are as fourth dimensional entities. But we don't live that. It's all there. It's all housed within us, but we just don't utilize it. We don't live it, but it's there for the taking. You know, all we have to do is to activate those systems. It's like having a mechanism that has been dormant for thousands of years, and then you step in, press the right buttons, hit the right sequence of nodules, and all of a sudden it turns on and you've got light. And that's who and what we are. And the calendar of old symbolized that. It was designed in a way, 28 days, 13 months. And it was purposely altered by Julius Caesar and put on a linear trajectory which took humanity off of its cyclic frame of reality and put it into a linear format. And it's just, it's deep, you know, we don't, we don't know. That's why I say it's about remembering. We don't know who we are. And if you don't know who you are, then it's going to be difficult to get back to you and do the things necessary. Wayne, I, I would not, not only do we not know who we are, we don't even know where we are. You know what I mean? So you can't. Or what, even, or what we are. Or what we are. We can't even navigate this. We're like in a cosmic soup of nothingness that we're just lost in. And I don't think people understand like really how important this conversation is. Guys, let me tell you something. If you do nothing else with the time that you spend on Clubhouse, go back and listen to this replay. Go back and listen to this replay. This will be up on the, the podcast, but you must listen and you must re-listen and you must take notes. And then, you know, because this is how you have to synthesize the information. It's not enough. You know, the YouTube scholars, is, it's, not going, it's not going to take you where you need to be. Okay, that's just uh, the icing, like it's just a, a topper. It's just like a, an appetizer. That's all it is. You got to dig deep. And, you know, I don't think um, most people are really right now clicking with, you know, what's actually happening right now in this room and the information that's being put down. You understand? And the reason that is, is because we're in a microwave generation. Okay, we want everything right now being spoof and we don't want to sit down and take the time out to actually invest in ourselves. What does that mean by taking the time out to be still to, you know, adapt a practice, you know, um, adapt, you know, um, read a book, you know, that's something because everyone wants everything right now, right here, you know, read a book, invest in yourself, you know, what I'm saying, um, join a workshop, you know, invest in yourself and really do because we're at the point where the information is already here, it's in us, but as you are accessing these different conversations like this, whether it's a book, whether it's a workshop, whether, what, whatever it may be, then it's reactivating the codes inside of yourself. So this is a super important information, but um, go ahead, Wayne. We don't know where we are. We don't know who we are. We don't know what we are because and we're all discombobulated, but it's, it's our minds and the frequency that our bodies are able to hold that can actually, it's not marching in the streets. 
it's not getting upset and you know like roused up about things that are going on that we're observing in our this quote unquote reality right this matrix it's not that it's about we could change all of this tomorrow like literally that's how fast it could shift if everybody was on the the right accord and it, the right accord does not mean the same accord you understand what i'm saying because if we have infinite possibilities infinite dimensions infinite worlds and each person is a world we don't have to all be on the same accord to actually shift the consciousness and shift the direction of this world uh, i'm going to hand the mic back over to you wayne and then we're going to take one more question go ahead wayne yeah um again i mean what you said is 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 so powerful because the science and this is the science you know there's there's a book by a a, a doctor slash scientist by the name of david r hawkins the name of the book is called power versus force he's written several other books since that one that was his first but what he brings to light dealing with different frequencies emotional frequencies because that's where it is in terms of shifting repatterning and changing oneself it really begins with emotional refinement and what he was able you know to you know uh calibrate with respect to emotional frequencies was that every emotion has a specific outpouring or output and fear he measured it at 200 um unconditional love he measured at 500 he said that a person who exists within the state of unconditional love can shift and counterbalance 750,000 people just for that one person to be in that state and not having had any direct three-dimensional contact with those 750,000. He also said that you can take one-tenth one tenth of one percent of the human population focused on one particular goal that needs to be shifted or changed and it will happen one tenth of one percent that's all it takes um the sister had a second question and i need to hear that second question again thank you brother. thank you brother um, um the second, the second question, question. I got a lot of feedback um was about the flat earth what is your perspective based on everything you've obviously learned what is your perspective about the flat earth theory that oh yeah about? yeah the flat earth theory <laughs> You know, I have I <laughs> I have a friend who a couple of friends who are really into that, and we go back and forth. They send me information on it all the time. There are a lot of different directions that I can go with that, but this is what I'll say: If the Earth was flat, then I've you know, I'm going to say two things. One is that I've been in, in the uh, astronomical, the observatories at University of Maryland. I used to spend a lot of time there when I lived in D.C. And I, I've looked through those telescopes and I've looked into our solar system. And my first question would be, why is the earth flat when all of the other planets in our solar system are round? Why is the earth flat when the model that's represented 
for production is either spherical or round with respect to electrons, atoms, you know, the way life is generated and expands itself is circular. Um, and I, I feel that it's a, it's a universal template. And when, when you look at sacred geometry, it falls into the field of sacred geometry. And I'm going to give you this, and I want you to ponder on this for a minute. So in ancient Kemet, they said that two interlocking circles was a symbol for the creative feminine force that brought the material universe into being. And I'm reading from my book now, Ancient Future. It represents the fundamental energy which lies at the basis of all creation. And without it, nothing could be. To remove its energy from all form and matter would bring about the immediate disintegration of the universe. Now, I've never seen a woman stand up and talk about the earth as being flat. To me, for me, it's a very masculine construct. And because the masculine mind, which is the left hemisphere, is a very um, linear design projection of consciousness. Whereas the right hemisphere, which is the feminine mind, is a very cyclical and expansive direction for consciousness. No, I think yeah, that's I a think bunch that's of riddles. You can call it whatever you want. Who said it, that? It, it, the it is. Hold out the pages. In ancient Egypt, they mapped out the shape of the earth that included not only the equatorial bulge around the center of the earth because it protrudes, but also the depression in the poles. Now, the ancient Egyptians mapped that out. The other thing that they did is they created astrology, which is based on a spherical design that incorporates the procession of the equinoxes, which have to be integrated into a spherical pattern in order for them to operate and have validity. If the earth was flat, then all of those sciences would be non-existent and would never ever have been created. That's a that's very, all I have to say on the flat. Very, that's a very interesting perspective. Brother Wayne, we might have to have you back. They be look, it'd be real smoke on this app about flat earth, okay? <laughs> we may have to have you back for a debate on the, but you know, a healthy um, conversation rather. I don't like debates about flat earth, but anyways, guys, um, one more question, um, flash your mics. If you have a question and I will, I'm scrolling up and down the screen. If you have a question, flash your mic. Okay. So I see, um, a professor, go ahead. You have the mic. Question. Thank you, Lisa. You know, my inquisitiveness is what led me to, have a passion for science and which later led me to become unchristian and i learned about the calendars so my question for you is what calendar do you follow and what calendar are we supposed to follow because now i'm like then i don't know my age 
like you know that type of thing so um, could you please um, let me know which one do you think we should be following there was a man um, he passed a few years ago um, his name was Jose Aguelos and oh let me see if I have is that the brother that wrote the time in the technosphere yep time in the technosphere mm -hmm. um he has a calendar which is a 13 month 28 day calendar and it deals with reintegrating with that specific formula because that helps you get back to who and what you are as a human being, as a transcendent being, as, as a highly evolved sentient being. Now, the thing with the calendar is that it's very difficult to live in the world, operate in the world, in our current environment, when you are being put upon and forced <laughs> in, into these calendrical constraints that, you know, you have to abide by. So this is where practices come in. Because when I sit and I do my practices, I go beyond any kind of calendar construct. I'm connecting directly with cosmological influence, knowing, and energy. Direct, it's, 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 it's a direct connection. The thing you want to really look into the impact that the Schumann resonance has, because the Schumann resonance is a pulse. It's a pulse that's generated from the earth. And what's really deep is that it's a spherical pulse. Spherical. It's not linear. It's not a linear pulse. But the Schumann resonance, I mean, this is a pulse that the military has been using for quite some time, you know, for its military campaigns, exercises, and such. Now, in 1980, the Schumann resonance was measured at 7.83 cycles per second. Right now, the Schumann resonance is measured between 40 to 50, and this is general, 40 to 50 cycles per second. So since 1980, the Schumann resonance, that frequency has been increasing and it's moving beyond this fabricated calendrical time frame that we've been put in that speaks only to the need for us to operate in 3D. So with the Schumann resonance, it's not really time that's speeding up. It's the creative process that is speeding up. It's the creative process that is now accelerating as new frequencies are being downloaded onto the planet. So it literally has moved us in terms of frequency past these artificially designed calendars that we've had to use you know to map out you know our point of existence in this culture so if you can get your hands on a 13 month 28 day calendar which I'm sure you can. I'm, I, was, I was trying to think of the name of his organization. Um, and I, I have a couple of his calendars, but 
they're not in front of me right now. Uh, but just if you can uh, Google um, Jose Aguelos, <laughs> she's she's going uh huh. Spell that. Um, oh, I got, oh it. I got it. Yeah, A R. Are we work it out? L L O S Jose Arguelos. And for those of you that are in my Discord, I'm pretty sure I uploaded that book. It's called Time in the Technosphere. Um, I'm pretty sure it's in there. Um, yeah. That's it. So that's where we are. You know, right now, you know, if, if you want to make a strong attempt to follow the order of that particular calendar, I'd say go for it. But I'd also say that if you really want to transcend the influence of the calendrical system that we're, you know, being influenced by, meditate. So uh, what we have to learn how to do, like he says, through meditation, we're able to collapse those waves when we can stand um, in the in the gap of nothingness, right? The space in between our thoughts, that's creation, right? That's the the um, the, the that's when the magic happens. Exactly, that's where it happens. It's called transcendental transcendental meditation. Okay, and so if we understand, like we don't need to be worrying about a calendar. Okay, you're the calendar. You know, uh, we're looking for a structure, and we are the structure right and so in order to break out of the prism of the construct that's been created for us it's all in our mind our minds are the projectors in this holographic universe that we live in we are creating the canvas of this world and that's why i try to get people to understand through each conversation you know that we're having you know um in the matrix unveiled and all the different platforms that you know we're on here on clubhouse the podcast our communities and, you know, such and such. So it's, you know, get out, you have to, you are, I remember one time I was in a meditation, I was really frustrated and I just, you know, went inside, went outside, laid on the grass at night and I just looked up into the sky, you know, and I just, you know, closed my eyes and all I saw was, I tapped in, it was a bunch of black people with afros. <laughs> it was like the seventies and they were like, you know, having like disco music and all that stuff. And they were laughing, they were having such a good time. This one lady, her face, her face came to the front of the screen. And she said, it was like a movie screen. She said, and I said to her, I said, why did y'all leave us down here to suffer? And she just laughed, right? It was like, oh my God, they showed us this in um, that movie, Lovecraft Country, um, when she was like traveling throughout space. That, oh my God, when I seen that, that part of the movie, um, of the series, I was like, like, I literally had that vision already years ago. And she laughed and she said that a moment in time, you know what I'm saying? For like, um, your time to us is like a, a couple of minutes, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, it's time is really um, subjective, right? Like you even experience time based upon what activity you're taking place. And if you're having a lot of fun, time for like what it says, time flies when you're having fun. Right, but you're at, if you're at work and there's a clock and you've got eight hours, right? It moves slowly. Like it feels like an hour went by and it's literally 15 minutes. So that lets you know that time is subjective. So we got to get out of the the idea of the construct of the calendar. So, um, guys, we are gonna have an after show, but I know um, Brother Wayne has to go. Any final words, um, Brother Wayne? Before and then I'm, I'm gonna let you tell him about um, what you've got coming up. Any final words you want to share with us? Yeah, I just wanted to say um, the sister who uh, asked that last question regarding time, you know, one of the things with the uh, the year 2012 that's significant is that in 2012, it said that we've now gone beyond time and gone beyond money, you know. Um, Everybody on this call, if you stop and think about your days, you will find that your days are moving faster than they have ever moved. That you go from sun up to sun down in a remarkable short period of quote unquote time. 
you know, right now, there's like 16 hours in our day. We're not even operating, functioning, you know, on our general 24 hour, you know, design. And the Schumann resonance has everything to do with that. The Schumann resonance is the essence of what's going on with respect to transformation on this planet. And it's receptive. You know, it's, it's, it's receptive so that it's pulling in all of the frequencies that are coming from the sun right now, our sun and our solar system, and all of, this, all of the uh, frequencies that are being projected from our central sun, uh, Alcyon, which lies at the center of our galaxy. You know, all of that is coming our way and it's unavoidable. All you have to do, reach out and take advantage of it and, you know, become something other than what you are. And it's an, it's, it's, it's an easy road. All you need to do is focus and grab it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, so um, I just want to go I ahead and say, Brother Wayne, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Can you let um, our audience know this is the Matrix Unveiled? You know, let them know what you have coming up and how they can get in contact with you. Bottom right of the screen. <laughs> I don't know when it goes off and when it doesn't, you know, because <laughs> my goes screen off when you're done speaking, because for whatever reason, um, when I'm, we're both unmuted, you um, I get an echo in my voice. So I just mute you and but I can't unmute you. So you have to. unmute. Uh, yourself. OK, so, yeah, um, people can go to my website. I believe you have, you know, that pin um, in the clubhouse. So they, they can use that www.waynebchandler.com. I don't even think they're using the www stuff anymore. So just go to waynebchandler.com. That's my, uh, my website. And um, in the second week of August, from the 9th through the 15th, I'm having a retreat, a seven-day retreat, you know, in Mexico. And we'll be, you know, the thing about Qigong that is so empowering is that it's very holistic. So on my retreats, we look at relationships. We look at gender specifics in terms of, you know, when a man and a woman come together in the mix, what does that look like? We look at... Um, cultivation of internal force, developing a different level of personal power so that you can express that out in the world in the form of self-empowerment. We look at how to create abundance for yourself, you know, using energy and different modes of operation tools that you can use. Like, for example, you want to face a specific way when you want to conjure or manifest abundance in the financial realm, um, you want to have a strong base chakra when you do that. You want to use a specific color of paper and a specific color of pen when you write out what it is that you want to manifest and you want to do that a specific number of times. We go through everything it's a very holistic experience and i love it you know i mean when we entered the age of covid you know i was locked down for a couple of years for a couple of years you know i wasn't doing retreats so this is the first retreat that um i have coming up in uh, two years well yeah 
a little longer than that since since uh, 2019. Okay, how okay, many, how many uh, do you use? Do you use well, I know well, the retreats that you do, um, there's a limited number of personnel so that you're able to work with each person individually um, and in groups as well. So um, how many slots do you still have available?
Yeah, I'm I'm going for 27 people. Um, so we still have room. You know, we still have room. Um, I'm bringing uh, two of my students, two of my female students, uh, who will be teaching specifically the uh, female Qigong practices for the women. And another one of my students who will be doing um, yoga, you know, in the morning. And she'll also teach a couple of uh, practices um, for women as well. So there's still space, there's still time. There is a form that you can go through if you just want to work with him. And you can just utilize that as a contact form, you know, um, to connect either for his healing practices. He said that that um, will be up there in on tomorrow, so you can do that. And, you know, um, also if you, you're having any issues contacting Wayne, just hit me up in the back channel, hit me up on Instagram. And um, I can definitely get you in touch with him. Uh, Wayne, can you give the people your email address as well? Yeah, sure. Uh, my email address is uh, Wayne B. Chandler at Gmail. Perfect. Thank you so much for being here. This has been a phenomenal room, phenomenal session. Um, I know that the people are going to go back and re-listen to this. So thank you so much for spending your time with us. Okay, thank you so much. I'll um, call you later. Peace. Peace. Thanks everyone so much for tuning in. Please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. For full podcast episodes, don't forget to click the link in the description box. Bye, y'all.